The concept of total defense and civil defense planning is back on the agenda. For resilience to work, it's both the whole of government and the whole of society um, effort, uh, and it's an effort which needs to um, go across um, national uh, boundaries as well. And that is the survivability and continuity of constitutional government, no matter what the threat is. But if the government fails, it does not survive the event. All is lost. Over the last 15 years, NATO has been driven by one mantra, which was out of area or out of business. I think there's a new mantra NATO has to focus on, which is in area or in trouble. And uh, governments accustomed to protecting their territories must, must now organize to protect their connectedness. I would argue resilience needs to be made a new core task of NATO. But in the governance of the continuity for a private sector, we always go to the board or the CEOs and we say, what are the five to 10% beyond people's safety? But beyond that, what are the five to 10% business process, location, suppliers, whatever, decide that you cannot lose no matter what. So we fold into the host nation requirements. We augment it, we try to support it. But the key point is, is that once we're there, we're gonna need host nation support and cooperation and transparency so that we can sustain that support with that country. The first person on the scene will not be a trained responder. It will be a bystander willing to help. And we have to look at that as a resource that we engage because the complexity and difficulty in responding to disasters means we do not have the luxury of treating our public as a liability that we must take care of. We're using scenarios such as improvised nuclear devices and we're doing it publicly. And it did not cause the concern that many people thought because people recognized the threat of weapons of mass destruction is out there. It is an improbable threat, but it's not impossible. And so we find that in many cases, we have to get not only the responders, but government officials to think the unthinkable. What happens if a device is detonated in Chicago? and then exercise what that looks like. A lot has been said already, uh, host nation support issues, minimum level of functionality, uh, requirements to be put on different vital societal functions or critical infrastructure, whatever you want to call it. Those types of things, I think it's, it's what we should be uh, probably discussing more. You know, what do, uh, cyber hackers, uh, monopoly energy cartels, terrorists, little green men, floods of humanity, uh, illicit flows of drugs, money, and technology have in common. It is that the arteries of our open societies can become channels for disruption to those societies. Uh, that is a security challenge we must think about. What does the country own in terms of those resources that you can mobilize for assets to support and help and work with the military in whatever crisis you are dealing with? And then take a look at the vulnerabilities. Hope for the best, plan for the worst. You're going to have to have redundant ways to be able to support a particular requirement. We have a regime for that where we ha have identified different uh, sectors representative for different uh, branches, uh, transport, energy, etc. And we engage them in exercises and we talk and we compare notes. And of course, we have mutual interests. Continuity uh, planning is part of that, so important for, for private sector as well. There has to be a seat at the table for the private sector as equal partners, because they have as much vested interest in the resiliency of the nation that which they provide services as the governments do. This is my risk. This is how I could solve it. I cannot solve everything. Where is the economical you know, uh, break-even point that I'm gonna take as this is my risk management. So it's about all risk management. 
The old Cold War concept, you know, was forward defense. I think forward resilience is a different way to deal with this gray area uh, and to help weaker societies, many of whom are our partners, to become more resilient societies. It's in our own self-interest to do that. I think we have a lot of tools we could offer to those partners. It would mean giving the Partnership for Peace, the EAPC as well, maybe a new theme. It would mean uh, adding resilience to the NATO-Ukraine uh, agenda, NATO-Georgia. If we're proactive, then we take seriously the concept of projecting resilience forward. And that means thinking about the band of weak, fragile territories, states, uh, you name it, a vast space all around the NATO uh, territory uh, that are completely susceptible to disruption. <laughs>